Um, This is our second in our series on love, and today we're looking at how our love for God, how we love him. Um, A little context for this passage before I read. Uh, Remember, I hope you will remember, uh, that God has brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He has rescued and redeemed them from the land of slavery with his strong arm and mighty power. Uh, That generation, apart from Caleb and Joshua, have all perished in the wilderness because they would not trust God and they continually complained about his provision. So here they are, Israel, about to finally enter into the promised land, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Moses is giving them the longest sermon in history and his last words to them. Uh, Deuteronomy means second law and here specifically the second giving of the law. The book recounts the teachings and events of Exodus and Leviticus. Um, The Ten Commandments have been repeated previously in chapter 5, and now in chapter 6, Moses gives the command, the statutes and ordinances that God commanded him to give to the Israelites. Um, Deuteronomy 6 is an exhortation to love and fear God by keeping his commandments and to pass this on to future generations. As I read, I want you to notice a pattern throughout the chapter. Uh, It's a five-step pattern. Uh, Verses 1 to 3, it's keep God's commands. Verses 6 to 9, it's teach them to your children. Uh, In the middle, in 10 to 15, it's do not forget God. Then step four is again keep God's commands, 17 to 19, and teach them to your children again, verses 20 to 26. Let me read. This is the command, the statutes and ordinances, the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I am giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may live a long, may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that he would give you, a land with large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, worship him, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the Lord your God will become, an angry, will become angry with you and obliterate you from the face of the earth. Do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massa. Carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God, the decrees and statutes he has commanded you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that you may prosper and so that you may enter and possess the good land the Lord your God swore to give your fathers by driving out all your enemies before you, as the Lord has said. When your son asks you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees, statutes and ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh and on all his household. But he brought us from there in order to lead us in and give us the land that he swore to our fathers. 
the Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity always and for our preservation as it is today. Righteousness will be ours if we are careful to follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we heard last week uh, about your love for us, um, your amazing love for us. Um, Father, through my words today, uh, through your words, through me, uh, I pray that our people here uh, will be uh, convicted, encouraged to love you in a way that you would want us to love you. Um, help us, I pray. Amen. Um, the most important verses I hope you would have picked up for today's topic are verses 4 and 5. But the rest of the chapter is the framework or the how of loving God. God knew that the Israelites would not remember him, that they would not be able to walk with him in this way after they entered into the comfort of the promised land. I look there at verse 10, a land with large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then what does Moses say? When you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. It's an aside at the start of the sermon, but it's worth briefly thinking about because that's where we are, isn't it? In a land of comfort and prosperity and peace, despite what the media and perhaps our hearts tell us. Have we forgotten God? Have we become too comfortable in our salvation? Have we forgotten the urgency that is the gospel and the need for everyone to hear it? God knew Israel would forget him, but he gave them this framework, this reminder, so that they would fear him all their days, keeping his statutes and commands so that they may have a long life. Um, I'm at point two in Deuteronomy 6, verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God. Bernard touched on this last week in answering a question at the end of the sermon, and it's important that we look at it because the Bible tells us many times, and it's in this passage a few times, that we are to fear the Lord. Now, the first thing I want to say is that if you don't think that this means that you should be knee-trembling terrified of God, then you haven't read your Bible enough, or at least you haven't read enough of your Bible. And you don't really know God, and so you should be terrified. Hebrews chapter 10 warns us, if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let that sink in for a minute. But, but God, remember last week God's love for us? What does love consist in? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The fear that God really wants is the fear that has moved us from recognising our sinfulness so that we throw ourselves on his great mercy, moving us to being in a reverent awe of his holiness, to give him complete reverence and to honour him as the God of great glory, majesty, purity and power. When God revealed himself to the Israelites at Mount Sinai through thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, they all trembled in fear at his great power. They even begged Moses to deliver God's message to them so they would not have to encounter God himself. And when the psalm writer reflects on God as creator, he says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. 
True fear of the Lord causes us to place our faith and trust in him alone for salvation. And that will always lead us to love him. Remember after the Israelites crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground and saw how God destroyed the Egyptian army who came after them? They feared the Lord and put their trust in him. And the writer of Psalm 115 encourages all who fear the Lord to trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. In other words, fearing God produces confidence, hope and trust in him. And these are necessary when we are looking to God for mercy, forgiveness and salvation. A right fear of God will cause us to love him like never before. According to Vine's dictionary, the Greek noun phobos can mean reverential fear of God, not a mere fear of his power and righteous retribution, but instead a wholesome dread of ever displeasing him. Oh, that our greatest fear in life would be that we would displease or offend God our Father. Now, as we dive into verse 5 in our look at our love for God, it shouldn't surprise us that when Jesus was asked a trick question about which command in the law was the greatest, that he would refer his hearers to this passage in Deuteronomy. He adds Leviticus 19.18 as well to reinforce love for God by loving our neighbour. The expert in the law had hoped that Jesus would either not be able to answer or would choose one and then be open to charges of not keeping the whole law. Now Matthew in chapter 22 quotes Jesus adding, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The word depend literally means to hang as a door hangs on its hinges. The entire Old Testament, the foundation of the Jewish faith and of the Christian faith, is summed up in and pivots upon two simple commands. Love God, love one another. Two simple commands, but with perhaps unreachable depths. Uh, Matthew records Jesus as swapping uh, soul for strength, and Mark has Jesus adding soul to heart, mind and strength. Um, I'm at point three, and how do we love God? As we heard last week, the world's definition is very weak. Um, The Hebrew word uh, means to have affection for, uh, desire for, delight in or to be fond of. It implies a passionate inclination of the mind and a tenderness of affection and shows a strong emotional attachment for and a desire to be in the presence of the object of love. Um, The Greek word is to have a preference for Uh, to wish well, to regard the welfare of. Uh, It's to take pleasure in, to prize it above other things, to be unwilling to abandon it or to do without it, to long for. We reduce and dilute the meaning of love when we view it as the world does, as simply an emotion or a feeling so that it's subject to change at our whim. I may love someone because they are kind to me. If they stop being kind to me, I no longer love them because my love was simply a positive feeling based on my current situation. But God's love, a godly love, is much more than that, isn't it? It's a decision of the will to act in light of a deep, enduring concern and affection for the object of our love. And when the Bible places loving God in the context of a command, as it does here in Deuteronomy 6, it becomes a galvanising force, a strength, for not only how we feel about God in our heart, but inspires our thoughts about him in our mind and stimulates our desires for him in our soul. Truly loving God motivates our every decision and empowers our very lives. Um, Our heart is much more than a pump that pumps blood around our body. Uh, In in the Bible, it's the centre of our physical and spiritual life. It encompasses our passions, our desires and all our affections. 
Um, the word heart came to stand for our entire mental and moral activity, both the rational and emotional elements. It includes emotions and reason and will. A heart and soul are different words, but both represent the inner, immaterial part of man as separate from his physical body. The soul is literally the breath of life that God breathed into man to make him a living being. Our mind is the faculty of understanding. It's what enables us to imagine and think and reason. And our strength is the ability or the force or the power that we exert in loving God. Now, each of these words, heart, soul, mind and strength, could be explored as to how we love God. But I think the collective meaning is a far greater lesson for us. We are not to love God with only a part of ourselves, but we are to measure every thought, every emotion, every feeling, every word and every action in light of our desire to please and honour him. We are to pursue our love for him in every aspect of our daily life, with all that we are. So what does a wholehearted love for God look like? Well, here are four descriptions of the kind of love God wants from us, according to the scriptures. We are to love God with an exclusive love. Matthew 6.24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And while some cultures advocate for polygamy, we all know that it doesn't really work. God calls the church his bride. He referred to Israel as his wife, and her willingness to worship other gods made her an adulterer. The first commandment that he gave to Moses was not to have any other gods before him. God is a jealous God, and he is jealous for his people with a righteous jealousy. Jesus' words in Matthew 6 are in the context of money or wealth, perhaps because he knew the hearts of his listeners. The religious leaders scoffed at Jesus and rejected him because their desire for power and money and position overcame their love for God. If we want to love God, we must love him exclusively. No other gods, no other thing can have our attention. Our hearts must be set only on what delights his heart. Our minds must be anchored only to his word as the final authority. Our souls must be satisfied only with what pleases him. Our strength, which includes all our time, our energy, our possessions, must be spent on what serves him alone. Second, we are to love God with a surpassing love. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus says these shocking words. The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it, and anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. And again in Luke uh, chapter 14, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It sounds offensive to us, doesn't it, to think that we must hate our own families. Surely this is not what Jesus meant. The word means to detest, but in context, Jesus is telling us that our love for God must be so deep, so enduring and so surpassing that our love for even our families looks like hate in comparison. So hate is to love much less. Our love for anyone, even our own mother and father or our husband or wife or children, must not overtake our love for God. Now, this has practical implications. Jesus is describing the cost of being a true disciple. If we love God most, then we will follow him in spite of any persuasion or any influence that would hinder us. 
The love for God that Jesus describes causes us to give up anything and everything that deters our passion for him. Our love for God must surpass not only our love for other people but also for the things of this world. Uh, John tells us that if we love the world, we do not love the Father. Demas, one of Paul's disciples, deserted the ministry to which he was called because he loved the world more. A surpassing love for God can keep us from trading away eternity with him for a few short years of pleasure on earth. And third, we are to love God with an obedient love. John chapter 14 verse 21 says, The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. They are strong words, aren't they? Obedience to God's commands are evidence that we trust that he is telling us the truth. It reveals that we believe that he loves us and desires the best for us, which is what covenant love is. We love God because he first loved us and because he showed that love by sending his son as a propitiation for our sins. To obey God is to honour him, which is something that we do for the ones that we love. Obedience delights God and shows that we have confidence in him. It's a tangible expression and truly is the only thing that we have to offer God in return for the great love and grace that he has given to us. Obedience is not difficult for us if we truly love God. And it gives clear evidence that we belong to him. John says in 1 John 2, just before the the passage that Phil read for us, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. If we love God exclusively with a surpassing love, then obedience naturally follows. And what a wonderful promise Jesus gives us as a reward for that obedience. He says that God himself will make his home with us in the indwelling spirit who makes us his home in our inner self. This is a secret of loving God. God's love poured out in our hearts, offered back to him in loving obedience. There is no debt economy here. It's a free gift. Fourth, we are to love God with a persevering love. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. One of the greatest examples of love is commitment. And what better illustration of persevering love is there than a couple that keeps their marriage vows for 50, 60, 70 or more years, for better or worse, despite the trials of life. My mum and dad have been married for 56 years and mum is suffering with Alzheimer's. She's okay, but she has next to no short-term memory. My dad shows patience and perseverance that I never knew he had. We were talking about how he does it recently, and he said, she's still the girl I married. 
God wants us to love him with a love that perseveres. Our love for God must endure. It is one thing to love a fellow human whom we can see and touch and hear and hug. It's far more challenging to love a God that we can't see, who sometimes allows us to go through challenging trials and who has made us promises that we are yet to see fulfilled. Perhaps this is why Jesus reminds us to love God with all our strength, a strength that only the indwelling spirit of God can provide. We must actively use our minds, our hearts and all our strength to persevere in loving God when the rest of the world tells us that we are fools. Um, I'm at point four now and it would be remiss of me in the time that I have left if I didn't spend some time on the familial aspect of this passage. Deuteronomy 6 is concerned with the individual's obedience to God, but it's also concerned with the nation and with families. Though our theme is all about keeping God's love, keeping God's commands because we love him, because he first loved us, the passage constantly references our children along with our obedience. Verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson. In verse 7, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In verse 20, when your son asks you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees, statutes and ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. So how are we to love God with our whole being and honour the Lord as our exclusive king? The words of the Lord are to be on our hearts. We are to teach God's words to our children and make his words a natural part of everything that we do. Sitting, walking, lying down, rising. The Jews began to follow verses 8 and 9 literally by using a phylactery, small boxes, containing scriptures around their arm and on their forehead and attached to the doorposts of their houses. God's design for the family is to make God's word a part of everything we do. Whether it be family meals, family devotions, attending church, work, schooling our children, driving in the car, playing sport, everything is to involve the word of God. His word should be read, meditated on and memorised. But more so, we ought to be applying God's word to every aspect of life. We want to be thinking God's thoughts after him. This is how we help our whole family, ourselves, our spouse and our children, to love God with our whole being. We make God's word central to our lives in all we do. Well, I asked the question earlier, how do we love God? Well, we love God with all our heart when we love him exclusively, him and him alone. We love God with all our soul when we find our satisfaction in him more than any other person or thing. We love God with all our mind when we make decisions to obey his every command. We love God with all our strength when we use all that we are and all that we have for him, to please him. And that strength will help us persevere in the face of every trial. Now I want to finish by challenging you with three short prayers. But ask yourself first, do I really love God in the way that he wants me to? Do I really love God in the way that he wants me to? Now and and throughout the week ahead, I want you to ask God to show you the ways that you aren't loving him the way that he wants. Not the way that you think you should, but the way his word tells you. Then I want you to ask him to help you, to give you the strength to love him with your first, your all, your everything. 
And third, this is where the rubber really hits the road. Ask God, if it's necessary, to remove, to take away whatever it is that is stopping you loving him with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, your everything. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, forgive us, um, for we, like the Israelites, forget you. We don't love you as we should. Father, keep these, um, these words uh, of how we love you, how you want us to love you, how your word tells us to love you, uh, on our hearts and our minds in the days and weeks and months ahead. Help us, Father, to truly love you as an outpouring response of the love that you have poured out on us. Father, we pray these things for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen.